Good morning. Good morning. It is an, it is uh, humid. It's warm in here, but it's warm with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 I want to welcome you to worship on this third week of July, July 18th, 2021. Special welcome to all of you here in person and those of you worshiping from home. Uh, just a few reminders as we begin this morning. Uh, I just want to uh, give a shout out, a recognition to our uh, v, uh, Faye and Jen and, and Gabby, our VBS staff this week. Can you give a round of applause? We had an incredible VBS. Uh, we had a very awesome VBS uh, this, this year because of COVID. We kept it in-house and uh, God was still faithful. God really worked and it was just great. Um, they memorized scripture like none other, and it was just awesome. So thank you for all your work. Next week or the week after, they will have a special video presentation prepared for us um, to kind of showcase uh, the VBS. This morning, we are also privileged to welcome the, the Reverend Paul Glover uh, to the pulpit. Uh, um, my dear big brother, uh, he came all the way from the far lands of Brooklyn. Um, uh, if, if you recall, uh, last month I, I had the privilege to go to Brooklyn and, and bring God's word to Flatlands Reformed, and this was our agreement because we said we were going to have a pulpit exchange. If I'm going to make the trek on that Belt par Parkway, you're doing the same. So uh, uh, his, his beautiful wife, Jill, and, uh, Sp and, and uh, Brother Spencer is here with us joining us in worship. So thank you for being here. Uh, if you're worshiping from home, if you have any prayer requests, please leave a comment in the chat bar or email them to uh, prayer at cccei.org, and we'll try to include that in our congregational prayer this morning. Our God calls us to worship this morning with these words from Ephesians 1, and I invite you to follow along with the bold words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Let us pray. God of grace and glory whom saints and angels delight to worship in heaven. And we, Lord, we, we bless you. We magnify you. We adore you as Lord of heaven and earth. We bless and thank you for all those made saints through Jesus Christ who have testified to your love and share the gifts that which you, with which you graced them. May your spirit be powerfully at work through the communion of your saints to build us all up in faith and love for loving service to each other and to the world you so love. This is the day that the Lord has made. We are here to rejoice and be glad in it. For this we pray in your holy name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. And this morning I invite you to rise and body your spirit and let's greet one another this morning. Share God's peace. And if you're worshiping from home, I invite you to share God's peace in the chat bar as we continue our worship. invite us to sing this together. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the fruit of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and
and you may be seated. Our God calls us into a time of corporate confession this morning with these words. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. I invite us to reflect back upon this past week. If there's any sins, any burdens, I invite us to bring it to the foot of the cross in this time of corporate confession. Let's go to God. hear these words of assurance beloved we are God's children now and what will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears he, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is we have confessed our sins we have been assured of our pardon I invite us now as one church to confess our faith with the Apostles Creed and we say together I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How are you? So today for announcements, I know the ladies' Bible study is getting together. So they will be meeting Tuesday, July 27th at 10 o'clock in the fellowship hall for a little time of fellowship. So that's wonderful to do this summer. And in addition to that, um, the council will meet on Wednesday night. If you have any concerns or any questions, feel free to talk to anyone on council about that. Um, in addition to that, um, yes, we welcome a pastor today, Pastor Paul. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, let's see. And then I know the youth group are doing something. Youth group and young adult, YA1 will be meeting Thursday, July 29th at 7 o'clock. So any questions, probably Pastor James or talk amongst yourselves. I'm sure you can uh, get the details on that. And um, yes, we just want to thank everyone for all their help with the barbecue. It was a wonderful time to get together and fellowship and I think everyone really enjoyed that after a long time of not gathering together. So that was wonderful. So um, let's just see, are there any prayer? Yes, hold on. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we know you hear our prayers, Lord. And even when we aren't sure what um, some of the written requests say, Lord, we know that you hear our prayers and we thank you that we can come before your throne of grace and bow our heads and, and worship you and come with our concerns, our cares, our thanks and our praise. Um, dear Lord, to each person that gets together this morning, where, whether online or in person, we ask that you bless them, Lord, and let them know that you hear our prayers <clears throat> and that we can bring everything before you, no matter what our cares. Lord, bless each and every person, and we ask for special blessings today for James's friend, Doug. 
um, a friend of the Father is failing in health. And Lord, we just ask that you touch them, give them healing, Lord, if that's your will, and um, Lord, give them peace, that person as well as the family. Lord, it's always hard to go through a struggle of ill health. And Lord, um, this one that I can't make out, um, Lord, just be with them, Lord. Um, it looks like someone lost a brother. Lord, we just ask for your healing of, of grace and a feeling of hope that we know that there is always hope in you for eternal life, no matter what goes on on this earth, that Lord, you have us in this entire world in the palm of your hands and that you control all things. And Lord, we just ask that you bless that family and give them peace. And Lord, we just want to thank you for the special, special time we, this week we had with the kids at Bible Adventure Camp. Lord, it was such a joy to see that child's faith um, that just grows in you, Lord, and um, trusts you. And um, we ask that you would touch our hearts, each person here, and give us some of that childlike faith, that trust despite difficulties that we encounter in our lives. And Lord, we just ask that you be with us today as we worship you with song, scripture, and sermon, and bless our hearts and bring that sermon into our hearts to fill us and renew us for the coming week. We ask this all in your name. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Special shout out to the online congregation this morning, worshiping from home, we have Lynn Olson, Jer Felice, um, Yvette, all the way from Columbia, South Carolina, Michelle Lamberg, Jean Burkle, and my predecessor, Al Luckel. Good morning to you. Um, it's like he's always making sure I'm staying out of trouble or something. Um, so uh, good morning to you all for worshiping from home, and uh, praise God for technology. Uh, this morning we have the privilege to welcome uh, the Reverend, the Right Reverend Paul Glover to the pulpit. And I just want to share one quick word. Uh, back in April, I had the privilege to uh, go out on a Saturday morning to serve at a food outreach at Flatlands Reformed Church. And Flatlands Reformed Church has over 360 years of Dutch Reformed history, um, good, bad, and ugly. But it was incredible to see this incarnational ministry of um, happening. Uh, it was incredible to see the church step up to the plate amid COVID, right? And, and I think it was back in May, right? You guys started. Within, within weeks of the shutdown in March, in May, they got in touch with, uh, I think, the city, and they were able to give out food boxes every single Saturday morning. And seeing their consistory members, their elders, their deacons step up to the plate every single Saturday morning, was mind-blowing. It was incredible. It was powerful. And then, and not only that, I, once I got caught wind of it, I said, I got to go check it out. And as soon as I went in April, uh, the, I think the vice president or, uh, of, of the consistory, uh, she, she put me to work. She said, all right, pastor, enough talking. Get to work. And I'm like, okay. okay. So I was lugging boxes and, and, and saying God bless you to people, but it was just powerful just to see that. Um, it just, you know, right here in New York, um, that our fellow sister Reformed Church was stepping up to the plate to do, doing mighty kingdom work, and I was just in awe. And then as we continue to converse, Pastor Paul said, you're coming to my church to preach. And I'm like, okay, well, you're coming to my church to preach. So I'm just so grateful that this day is finally here where we can uh, finish that pulpit exchange and, and, and really just uh, hear God's word. So Pastor Paul, come on up to the pulpit. Let's give a warm Christ community welcome to Pastor Paul. Good morning. Good morning, giving honor, glory, and praise to God this morning and to Christ who is the Lord of my life, um, to your pastor, Pastor Lee, the angel of this house, his lovely wife, Jen, I thought I saw her, um, and their two lovely children, Isaac and Naomi, to the council, 
Uh, and to you, our brothers and sisters here at Christ Community, I greet you all this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, it is truly a honor and a privilege to be with you this morning. And to be honest, this is the first time I have been in in-person worship since, I believe, the second Sunday in March of last year. We've still worshiping virtually <clears throat> um, because the city just, well, it's the city. But anyway, moving along, um, you know, and so just sitting there as we were singing that opening hymn and even your order of service, which just goes to show that you can go to any reformed church and still feel the spirit of Christ in that community. Oh, wow. Christ community. Oh, okay. Um, and so, again, thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Um, I truly hope that uh, I do not embarrass Pastor James for having make, made the invitation because he has not heard me preach, which is a dangerous proposition when you invite a preacher, by the way. Um, but I also want to acknowledge my lovely wife and Spencer, if you would just stand up. Um, both of them are God's instruments of accountability in my life. My, ref my wife refuses to let me go any place unsupervised. And Spencer, he just shadows. Thank you. Thank you both for accompanying me this morning. And so this morning, my task is to share God's word, to break open God's word with you. I think there are just a few things I should share with you in the interest of full disclosure. One is that uh, my wife has remarked over the years that uh, my sermons sometimes can be a bit dry. And so I'll tell you what I told her. If you drink lots of water, you'll get it down. The second thing I probably should share with you is I love God's word. And sometimes I get excited. And so if I should happen to get excited in the pulpit during the presentation, um, it's going to be okay. Amen? Amen? All right. And so the word of the Lord this morning comes to us from the book of uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 24 in um, I would just like to lift up, if you would allow me, the first 20 verses. Hear these words that have been recorded in the Lord's Gospel, uh, in the book of 1 Samuel, the 24th chapter, beginning at the first verse. And I'm reading from the NIV. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. When he came to the sheep pens along the way, a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave, and Saul said, This is the day the man said this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe afterward David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went away. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? 
This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize that I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, Lord Jesus. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hand but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will, be, that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. This is the word of God. For the people of God, thanks be to God. Joseph Needleman, a 20th century philosopher, um, Jewish theologian, and scholar, he posed the question, what's wrong with the world? I wonder if anyone in this assembly, this gathering this morning, has ever at any time pondered the question, what's wrong with the world? Dr. Needleman, he not only posed the question, but he also offered a proposition, an answer, a response to the question. Would anyone like to know what that is? Well, Needleman said, we know what's wrong with the world. We just don't know what to do about it. You know, as a pastor, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard spouses say, I don't know what's wrong with him. In fact, I've even overheard Jill, don't tell her I said this, I've overheard her say, I don't know what's wrong with him. Or some have complained about the people on their jobs. But I know no one here at Christ First has ever complained about anyone on their job. Some maybe have complained about their neighbors, people in community. Or young people. Are there any young people in the assembly? Don't raise your hand, but believe it or not, young people actually complain about their parents. Imagine that. Imagine. And so when we take a high altitude view of, for many, 
The world today seems like a very hostile, unfriendly, and messed up place. But what often I believe gets overlooked in that personal assessment of how horrible our world has become is the fact that God has told us that the world is messed up. In fact, God, through the pages of scripture, continues to remind you and I, the faithful, the chosen, the members of Christ's body, that the world is messed up. And so, God, like Dr. Needleman, goes one step further in the Bible. How many people know that God has actually identified the culprit of the problems in the world? How many people know that? Well, for those that don't know, if you want to find out who God has identified as the culprit for the conditions of the world today, when you go home, look in the mirror. And you will see whom God has pointed out as contributors to the condition that our world is in. Okay, now that I have thoroughly depressed you this morning, I'm going to add just a little bit more depression. The larger problem and the conundrum for us is we haven't listened when God told us that we can't fix what we've broken. Right? And it's the more that God continues to tell and show us that we can't fix it. You know what we do as good Christians? We keep trying to fix it. And things keep getting worse. I told you I was going to add a little more depression. Right? But here's where, to me, our efforts to fix our problems in our relationship, our culture, our society, go from the ridiculous to just downright hilarious. Has everyone ever noticed that when people talk about the problems and issues that exist, either in our world or their personal relationships, it's usually the other person's fault. Come on. Has anyone ever noticed that? Shame the devil and tell the truth. Come on now. <laughs> it's them. It's the other side. It's him. Or in my case, Jill says, it's Paul. And the proposed solution is, if they would just change, if they would just do the things the way that I think, I see, I feel, they should be done. Our marriage, relationship, places of employment, communities, homes, would all be better. And so when we look at the struggles, the tensions, the problems in David and Saul's relationship, in their minds, in Saul's mind, David was his problem. But from David's perspective, Saul was his problem. And both of them believed that the solution was eliminate the other. Just get rid of them. And my life will be problem free. What their respective approach to solving their perceived problem reveals is the human desire 
to write and create our own salvation story. In other words, we believe that we can fix it. When Jill and I were dating, quick story, right? Jill worked out all the time. Every time I talked to her, she was going to the gym. And I didn't. I mean, as you can see, this is all soup, salad, and chicken. <laughs> and I believed, once it was clear that she was God's chosen for me, I had predetermined in my mind, I'm going to change her before she changed me. Yeah, anyway, moving along. But this passage here asks us as God's people, as followers of Jesus and members of the body of Christ, a fundamental question. Do we want to be God's change? Right. To me, that is the essential question that emerges from this passage. And before you say, well, preacher, that is a ridiculous question. Here's why it's not ridiculous. Because no one becomes anything he or she does not desire or strive toward. You cannot graduate and get a degree if you don't enroll in school. Hello, somebody. You cannot achieve financial independence unless you take steps toward better financial stewards. All right, Pastor James, they're getting angry with me. Let me move on now. But I need you to think about this this morning because we are all Biblical scholars, we've all read the Bible. We're, we're familiar with the narrative of David and Saul's relationship. And the thing that is most glaring to me is nothing changed between David and Saul until something changed within David and Saul. When they experience God's change, Within their hearts, I want you to notice that the tension in the moment lessened. The hostility that they felt towards each other decreased and dissipated. And instead of going at each other, they were actually able to engage in civil and respectful dialogue that led to genuine repentance and reconciliation. They both acknowledged their mistakes and wrongs. And this is what opened the door for healing and repair to take place. And so if you don't remember anything else I say to you this morning, Please remember this, if nothing changes, then nothing will change. And so the question isn't what needs to be changed in others, church, but what God says to us through the pages of scripture, through the living example of the Lord Jesus Christ, is what change does God want to make within you and me? As I allow, as you allow, God through his spirit and the spirit of Jesus that lives and resides within us to initiate God's process of change in our heart. I declare this morning, we will notice a renovation in our outlook and worldview. 
we will notice a reordering of our values and priorities. We will become God's change in our marriage, on our jobs, in the lives of our children and grandchildren, in our own personal orbit. You know, the places where you and I live, work, worship, and play. And so this morning, do you, do we, as followers of Jesus, want to be God's change in our world today? In this passage, we see that our desire to be God's change in our relationship and our circles, the circles where you and I live, where we work, where we worship, and where we play, will be challenged. Has anyone ever noticed that when you make a, a sincere decision to do anything for God, all hell breaks loose? Oh, I said hell, sorry. <laughs> But I mean, that's what it is, ain't it? The bottom falls out, the ceiling caves in, your children and grandchildren lose their natural mind. What is going on here? And so, in some cases, we may not even be aware that our desire to be God's change is being challenged and being undermined. And one of the areas that we must look at are the voices that we are listening to and those whom we have chosen to surround ourselves with. What you talking about, preacher? Well, both Saul and David in this passage were incited to do harm to each other. Think about that. Saul wasn't even thinking about David until one of his men said, well, listen, David is in the desert of En Gedi. Right? David wasn't even thinking about harming Saul until one of his men said, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord, right? That the Lord has handed him over to you. Every person is influenced by the voices he or she exposes him or herself to. You, me, and every other person, our worldview, our, the approach to life that we choose, the approach to love and relationship is shaped by the voices we consult, confer with or choose to get our information from. Can I tell you the truth? I stopped listening to Oprah long ago. <laughs> Not that she's a bad person, but I'll just pass on some of that. And so you and I need to vet our sources of information. We need to double check to make sure that the sources we've fallen in love with are consistent with God's view, with God's agenda, and not the popular view or the one that, well, you know, the one that supports our view. But more importantly, church, there are going to be times when we are going to need to muster up the courage to override and to contradict those same sources when God brings to our attention that what's coming across the airwaves, the print media, and podcasts, and everything else is inconsistent with God's will for God's people to be God's change in this world. And let's face it, can we agree on this this morning? That no one in this world except God is right all the time. 
I'm sorry. I don't care who you listen to. No one in this world is providing 100% complete, accurate information 100% of the time except God and Jill, my wife. She's right all the time. And so the breakthrough, Pastor James has given me the time sign. Let me run to the close. The breakthrough. David and Saul experienced was a defining moment. As God had seemingly served up Saul to David. Can you imagine? David must have thought it was Christmas Day. <laughs> oh, glory. But instead of taking justice into his own hands and giving Saul everything that he deserved. God, in that moment, changed David's heart. And David gave Saul what he didn't deserve. Mercy, respect, honor, and loving kindness. I need us to really think about that. Because let's face it, sometimes we can get so caught up in revenge, getting even, and our view of justice. But as believers in Jesus Christ, here's what we must never forget. If God were to have given each of us everything that we deserve, no one would be here. These pews, this pulpit would be empty. If God were to give each of us, and I'm talking especially to those of us that were born saved, you know, those people that come out the womb sinless, have never sinned a day in their life, that even you, if God was to have given you everything that you deserve, you wouldn't be here. The reason this was a defining moment was because other people were watching David. They were watching to see what David would do and how David would act in this moment. And however David acted, however David responded, it was going to carry far-reaching ramifications because it would have told the watching world about David's character and the relationship he shared with his God. It would have told the world about this great David. How much did he truly trust God? The God that had delivered and saved him in the past. Did he really believe that God was and is working to recreate a just and peaceable world and society? Did he truly understand that people and life will break and devastate you? But God, God can and will heal and restore you. But here's why you and I should want to emulate David's example. Because when we can show mercy, kindness, and respect to those who don't deserve it, it demonstrates that God's transforming power is at work in us. And it says to those who are watching us that God is unfolding his plan to renew and restore the world one person at a time. 
Or let me put it this way. When you and I have been changed by God, we'll become God's change in the places where we live, work, worship, and play. I leave you with this. I know this is the third close, right? This is it. I promise. This is it. Here's a challenge. How many, how many of us are willing to accept the challenge this morning? Okay. Here's a challenge for you and for me. And let me just say this. I made a decision, a commitment to God a long time ago that as a preacher and a pastor, I will never ask the people of God to do something that either I myself am not doing or am not prepared and willing to do. So I guarantee you, I'm going to do this with you just in Brooklyn. So here's the challenge. Can we be just a little nicer and less demanding this week to those who either serve us our coffee, those who serve us in the supermarket, or wherever we may go out to eat? Everybody with me? You got that? Wherever you interact with someone in the coffee shop, in a restaurant, in the supermarket, can you, can you and I be just a little, we're talking increments here, come on, increments, just a little bit nicer and less demanding? Can we be a little more patient with those who annoy and frustrate us just a little bit. And here's how I handle that one. I'm not the most pleasant and easiest person to get along with. And I just remember that. Can we try to see the point and view, a uh, point of view and perspective of those who aren't on our team who don't share our worldview? I'm not asking you to agree. I'm asking you, can we just step back and really try to put ourselves in someone else's position who doesn't see the world the way we do, think about things the way we do? I think they call that empathy, not sure. Can we remember that every time you and I encounter and interact with others, it's a defining moment? It's a moment where you and I have the opportunity to help someone else see Jesus and to see God's life transforming power at work in us and why they too should try our Jesus. Won't you bow your head? Gracious, loving, and eternal God, our Father, Lord, we thank you, we bless you, and we praise you. Father, please forgive the preacher. He was a bit long-winded this morning. But we pray, God, that the word that went forth would be a seed sown in the hearts of the people. And that someone this morning, God, would have been encouraged, enlightened, inspired, challenged, and ultimately that we all will be changed and become your change in this world. In the mighty matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. God is good. And all the time. I thank you very much, Pastor Paul, for that powerful message. I needed to hear that word. I'm sure all of us needed to hear that word. And you were not long-winded. You didn't go long. So, I mean, you could have, had, you could have gone a, a couple more minutes, you know. <laughs> Church, I invite us to rise in body or in spirit. As we respond to the word, as we reflect upon the word, I invite us to sing in response to the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, as we remember the power of God's word in these defining moments.
and you may be seated. As always, uh, online offering is available uh, through Venmo uh, and through Zelle. The information is available in your worship bulletins as well as on our website. Uh, if you're here worshiping in person, the offering plates are available in the back with envelopes as you leave after the service. So please bow your heads with me as we pray for our offerings and our tithes. Lord, as we reflect on the story of David and Saul, as we stand in awe of your sovereign power, Father, we give these offerings and tithes to you. We give what is not ours to you. Father, we pray that you may multiply these offerings for your glory's sake. Father, we also remember our, our, our brother Michael, our, our, one of our elders, as he proclaims God's word at our sister church, Mass Speaker Reformed Church, this morning. We pray that you may bless him. We pray that you may speak through him mightily, that the word of God will be proclaimed. Father, we pray for those who are doing mission work near and, af near and afar. We pray that you may continue to be with them, even in this pandemic. We pray for protection, and we pray that these offerings and these missionary offerings will be used mightily so that your name will be proclaimed from nation to nation and across the world. We thank you once again for the power of the gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, amen. amen. I invite us to rise once again in body or in spirit and we'll worship the Lord with the new doxology and the Reverend Paul Glover will give the benediction. grace of God, the love of God, and the fellowship of God, the Spirit, bind your heart, mind, and soul, now and forevermore, while we are absent one from another, until we all meet again. And God's people said, Amen. go in peace, saints of God.